I don't, don't want place to blame on on anyone else, and and I can only speculate what could have been. But I I do feel sort of a bad blood with um, Victor Conte because he really played fast and loose with this whole thing. He ran around and told everyone that was going on. You go to these trade shows, and everyone. I'd hear him talking to people about what he's doing, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? I am here today with Patrick Arnold. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Thank you, Johnny. I'm fine. Good. So people are going to ask, or people are, people are going to know quite a lot about you, I think, watching this. So I was wondering if we could just start off with a bit of background, essentially, about how you kind of came to develop this reputation about how you came to, you know, be involved in the things that, that you were involved with. Well, I was always a very inquisitive and curious child. I did a lot of reading of uh, encyclopedias, uh, scientific literature. Father kept a well-stocked library and magazines and everything. And I was very much into health and fitness as well. I eventually went to college and decided to major in chemistry and I did and I got my degree and I went to work and the area of chemistry that I specialized in was called synthetic organic chemistry which is what you need to make manufacture all kinds of organic stuff drugs in particular is a good example so I eventually through various opportunities or just things I decided I wanted to do, started making certain drugs. Um, at first, it was not thing, what I was doing at my job, and I did it on the side, and, and I kind of became proficient at it, and I did a lot of research into, into pharmacology, and I learned a lot about a lot of different varieties of drugs, but in the case of this interview, performance-enhancing drugs, were an interest to me. And I kind of found myself going down that trajectory that led to me th developing nutritional supplements for performance enhancing or physique enhancing, health enhancing, or performance in sports. The obvious application there, is, which is very quite relevant here. So that would be my background, I suppose. And you actually, um, you kind of have a background in, in training as well, right? Like you, you trained, you weren't just a sort of guy in a lab, like you, you actually... I I, tr I trained, obviously I've always trained in, in a gym and quite into it. Never, I never was a trainer of others. Sorry. So, but uh, yeah, I'm quite familiar with exercise, physiology, uh, muscle anatomy and all such things and biochemistry of the body physiology yeah and i think uh, that kind of practical understanding would, would probably complement the the theoretical and and the chemistry kind of understanding as well um i think that, that probably helped you you know b become this yeah. unique um yeah it was a kind of con convergence of uh two knowledge bases the chemistry and the um practical application of of exercise and sport so that kind of led me to a unique area of expertise you might say my little niche and i mean in your own words what what would you say that kind of niche was exactly it would be someone that has the knowledge to develop effective products um in the regulatory sense to you can, there's drugs and there's also nutritional supplementation but they're all the same thing they're all chemical compositions or chemical compounds designed to enhance strength, performance, health, um, sometimes cosmetic appearance, but all all those things that are interlinked. Uh, interlinked. Yeah. So people talk about PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, PIEDs, performance, and as you just mentioned, an image enhancing drugs, that sort of thing. So people are, are very concerned about the use of drugs in sport essentially so that it's an interesting thing because in other walks of society or other parts of society for example people are perhaps less concerned about 
drugs that would enhance performance. Um, and I mean, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on performance enhancement generally, and then as it relates to yeah, sorry, as it relates to elite professional sport, but performance enhancement generally. How do you think about that? Performance enhancement can encompass a lot of things, enhancing your strength, enhancing your ability to recover from exercise trauma, or you can go another direction, you say enhancement of your mental facilities, enhancement of your ability to concentrate, your ability to learn, your ability to maintain a, a awake state, so to speak. Uh, I suppose one could say emotional stability that is uh, supported by pharmaceuticals or something may fall into play there. So you can see that it's it's a, it's a huge umbrella that we're speaking of here. Yeah, and I mean, people, are, as I kind of just mentioned, people are not averse to using drugs. You know, if, if you're depressed, you get an antidepressant. If you yeah. have a headache, you take you take a pill. You know, if you have a surgery, you'll take a pill uh -huh. for that. I was wondering why you think that in the context of sport, for example, what are these kind of like cultural factors? What are the reasons why people are so concerned about drug use in this in this specific walk of life that is sport? That's a good question. If you look at history, the ancient Greeks, they didn't ban any stuff. They took all kinds of stuff that maybe would make you puke, you know, or probably wasn't very healthy, but they didn't care. But they cared more about, oh, if you were to, if you were to cheat as far as throwing in a, a competition as far as to get money, you know, that's the worst. And I agree that that is bad. You know, look at the, Black Sox scandal, and Pete Rose, everything. But I think it all with what modern Western society it came, all came down to these, this old myth the adage uh, that it's not if you win or lose, it's how you play the game, which is quite farcical because I can't think of any aspect of life where that's true. I mean, if you're a, if you're a CEO of Fortune 500 company, or if you're you know you behold the stockholders, shareholders, and or just about anything you, you can think of that involves money and power, they don't, <laughs> first of all, no one ever practices that adage and, and you rarely do you ever say that they should. It's just considered that you're going to, if you're really good, it's because you did whatever you had to do to get that way. And within a certain confines that are reasonable, anything goes. But in sports, it's like, no, you can't do this. You can't do that stuff that's completely harmless other than the fact that it does confer an advantage with the user over other people, then that becomes a, a source of um, controversy or contention because it kind of forces everyone to tr to, to do whatever, the, to undergo the means to, to enhance themselves as much as they can, which means everyone would feel as though they have to take the same drugs, have the same elite trainer, uh, where do you stop? That's the question. What, what are, what are the, what are the things that we need to be concerned about? Is it, is it this esoteric fairness thing or is it the health of the athlete? And I think that you have addressed that before. <laughs> yeah. So, so my PhD thesis, it looks at exactly this point. I mean, as you said, so, so there is this win at all cost culture. Uh, that, that's prevalent. And I think there's a huge difference um, between professional, especially elite professional sport, um, where there's a lot of money involved and amateur sport. So I think that's something to kind of flag up first. But as you said, it comes down to this idea of the level playing field and fairness and, and kind of, I think what people sometimes forget is that the playing field, and I know you said this, is never really level. Right. So just to give an extreme example for everybody, I could take any drug experimental, have the best training, the best nutrition, etc. And Usain Bolt would still beat me in 100 meters. I just do not yeah. have the genetic gifts to beat that guy. So it's never I know it's an extreme example, but it just illustrates the fact that the playing field is never really totally fair. Right. Well, what when somebody wins, what are we looking at uh, as far as why? Why did they win? 
And a lot of people say, well, the person that works, if you work hard enough, you'll win. It's like, no, it's first and foremost, and above anything, it is your genetic predisposition to a particular event. After that, yes, how hard you work, how you how smart you work, big, big contribution. Uh, your exposure to the right people that can train you, that give you a good mental attitude or know how to do specific training that is better than most other people might provide. You know, that confers an advantage. Uh, nutritional interventions, you get a good nutritionist, learn how to eat eat healthy. That's going to make a, a big difference. Uh, are you rich? Did you grow up with a rich family? Or are you poor and you have to work <laughs> and then train after work? That makes a big difference. But if there's which... You have to keep that in mind when you talk about the ethics of doping. Because why do we suddenly say, okay, well, you can't do that, but everything else is unfair? So that's exactly it. I mean, I, you, and you raised so many interesting points. So one of the things that I actually talk about in, in the thesis is getting rid. So there are three, for under WADA sport, for example, there are three main reasons for a substance or method to be prohibited, right? Potential to enhance sports performance this level playing field kind of fairness argument and then this this sort of i suppose risk to harm argument now i would say that the enhancement criterion this this idea this criterion that, that suggests that like enhancement is a problem that should go that in and of itself if you really take that at face value it's Where inane, stop. right? As you said, because yeah. any number of things can enhance performance, right? So what uh, the, the the phraseology in the WADA code, for example, so anybody, uh, WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, talks about the virtuous perfection of our natural talents. Now, it all comes down to this word virtuous, <laughs> right? It's, like, yeah, I don't you know, laugh, but it's kind of hard not but to. But that's exactly it, right? That that I, I, I totally understand. And the amount of athletes and coaches I've spoken to, and they laugh. They just have exactly the reaction you have. So anybody, where, where I'm going with it, anybody who's actually been involved in the industry, and that's a very broad kind of categorization, has the same reaction as you. There is a lot that is not virtuous about sport, even certainly at the professional level, even at the amateur level. You either win or are a winner or you're, you're not even regarded. You will not profit. And I, when I say profit, it's also personal profit. First and foremost, a personal profit, which is fine, you know, your, your uh, reputation. But even with amateurs, there's such a financial component in there. You can't remove it. And if you don't win, you get nothing. In fact, a lot of times you spend all your own money to try to win and you end up behind. Whereas the winner gets endorsement contracts or if they're professional, they get a huge salary. Um, so you can just throw that virtuosity out of the window or virtuousness, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think that's that's very well put. And I mean, yeah. it, as you said, it has a profound impact on, you know, the way in which people, it's this winner take all mentality. Uh, and it is very much reflected in sport. So people are naturally going to do, or naturally it's probably the wrong word, but people are going to do all sorts of things to, to gain an advantage, right? And one of them that's attracted a lot of media coverage, for example, is taking things like anabolic steroids, right? Yes. And but, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Sorry, you, you you go ahead. No, no, I uh, I thought that you would pause, but it was not a pause. Pause. <laughs> yeah. Well, all I was going to say is yes. Yeah, so, so you know, pe and people are very concerned about the use of anabolic steroids, particularly above other things, even in sports. For example, where just playing the sport, I'm thinking about rugby union and American football and ice hockey, where you know it's contact collision sports, where actually just playing the sport is inherently risky. We're, we've seen all the stuff in the US about concussions and, and TBI, traumatic brain injuries. And, you know, in the UK, there, there's litigation going on at the moment too. So it might it might lead one to conclude that like, well, hang on, how, how dangerous are these performance enhancing drugs, especially within the context of sports 
like that where you know you get major injuries and those sorts of things i, I i'd love you to kind of speculate on because because you must have seen a lot of this the actual real life dangers of things like anabolic steroids you know how dangerous obviously under doctor supervision medical supervision and i don't want to lead you here but like you know how dangerous are they would you say well it's rare that you ever get an objective discussion of this because there's just so much so many false falsehoods out there and, and misconceptions that have just been perpetuated for decades uh we could just take anabolic steroids for instance they're going to give you a heart attack you'll you'll die in 5 years you take any any of this stuff it's going to and there are certain side effects or, or certain you know, dangers just like with anything any any drug you take yeah there's no safe you might no every safe. day I, yeah so when you look at it from an objective standpoint especially when it comes to performance enhancing for an athlete that has to be in very good shape that has to perform an event you're it's not very common or not very likely that that person's going to suffer any major harm. Now, you must also remember that a competitive athlete is not a bodybuilder. Now, you look at a bodybuilder, the 275 pounds guy with 4% body fat or something, that's not a healthy thing. <laughs> and that, But that guy doesn't care about his health. And plus his health, if he doesn't not sprint on that stage, as we did, he probably dropped dead, you know, when he goes to pose. So when it comes to enhancing performance of an athlete, I'd say a track athlete in particular, or, or a sprint athlete who seem to really get the most from like an anabolic steroid drug, they can't take very much. If they take too much, their muscle tone goes too high, they become too tight, they got a pair hamstring or something. So they actually take pretty minor doses, but these people are also so genetically gifted that just that little enhancement till so far, and it really is an edge, a huge edge. But you cannot use the argument that it is dangerous or unhealthy to them to justify them. If you're going to use that one alone, that is not sufficient, in my opinion. I So a couple of things uh, that, that I'd like to pick up there. People need to remember that most of these drugs were developed and are still used in, in some context as, as medicines, right? They're developed... Yeah. You've developed for children and women, even. I mean, a lot of these anabolic steroids that are that are uh, the milder ones, less androgenic, and they still work right? Quite well, the, the, yeah, the more anabolic, less androgenic. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's an important thing that that people should remember that you know they can be used and are used. And now we have this whole industry of TRT, H, uh, testosterone replacement therapy, TRT, HRT, or hormone replacement therapy. So. Okay. They, they are used safely or relatively safely because, as you said, any drug will have some risk, right? But even like, to use Chris Bell's example, vitamin C has some risks, right? Nothing is totally safe necessarily. So I think it's it's quite interesting to kind of think about the fact that steroids are so vilified when, as you said, the the, 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 the discussion is not necessarily objective, on these things. If we took another drug that I've written about, for example, painkillers, they could actually be more dangerous. And certainly the addiction potential is probably yeah. higher. But people are less, deal. yeah, you, you go. Yeah, well, no, that's a big deal, the, the addictive potential. And then if you start uh, become addicted, you start using larger, larger amounts, you could always suffer respiratory failure or something from, from an opioid. Uh, and and you know, we've seen you take a pill, it's that fentanyl and then you're you're dead. You know? Exactly, so, and no, we've I, seen that the opioid epidemic is in the U.S. and and it's it, you know it's it's also a problem here. Uh, you know we've seen the kind of there are people people will sort of be so concerned about steroids, but then that's an obvious thing where there's greater harm that's clearly demonstrable, right? Like it it it's yeah, and yet painkillers and athletes are are not perhaps vilified as as much as steroids are, for example. Well, this this supports the argument that I believe that you've, you like to bring up often of, of we should be concerned about harm reduction. 
we should not just be concerned that everything, every drug you take or every method of doping, which, and there are different methods that are, don't involve drugs, such as blood doping. We should be concerned, okay, which one of these interventions is going to be harmful to the athlete and which are not. And before you even go further than that, let's eliminate the ones that are clearly harmful and say that we're going to make sure that you guys don't take this because if we see it in your system, you're going to get a suspension and this is for the good of everyone and we can present an argument that you is is um quite convincing and then you're left with okay you got these other substances which generally can be used to enhance performance that are not dangerous to the athlete so what do we do with those and what are the justifications for banning those yeah so i mean i'll go back to the uh, those are really good points i'll go i'll go back to the sort of the the rationales that wada gives for banning it so we have this enhancement criterion that we've talked about which is you know pretty, well, pretty out, out the window. <laughs> yeah so then yeah. we're left with the spirit of sport and fairness right and then health no. and it, so they have a two out of three approach but as you said like if the health approach goes out of the window or you can even make an argument saying well hang on if these are regulated more and people are taking them out in the open more uh that, that they could even be healthier right because anything that's done behind the scenes is, is arguably no, like, absolutely when you allow for an open discussion and you allow for doctors to be involved then people will or they will be able to use these things in a healthy manner and not suffer the risks if you sweep it under the carpet and people are going to just go use them willy-nilly without any guidance that can be dangerous uh, so I suppose you got to think, is it possible to allow people to use certain things and monitor them? Maybe just monitor certain health markers of the athlete, make sure that there's nothing going on in their body that indi indicates there's some, some toxic reaction or some long-term uh, effects that could manifest themselves down the road. Then... You know, that athlete, there's no health reason to ban that athlete from performing. I mean, exact. so on this exact point, we, we already, elite athletes are already tested a lot, right? And there's this thing called the Athlete Biological Passport, which I'm sure yeah. you know all yeah. about. Actually, but yeah. for, the, for, the, for the viewers and the listeners, it, it measures basically blood values over time and looks for deviations and, and those sorts of things. But we could use that technology to kind of measure health markets as well, right? So one of the things I, I talk about is fitness to compete tests and monitoring athletes' health, essentially, where, you know, it, perhaps you can e even make arguments that okay. what does very heavy training, lots of competition, stressful life, travel, it's all going to reduce things like testosterone, right? You can make an argument that, you know, their TRT, argument the hormone replacement argument that all these things depress testosterone and there's a there's a health argument for augmenting it in a sort of hrt trt way yeah well when you present it that way not only are you talking about uh preventing health problems you're talking about uh supporting interventions that could help the health uh, of an athlete because because of what they're because of the deleterious effects of, of heavy training Exactly. Uh, and I think that's an interesting way to kind of flip it around on its head. So what I, I think I, I should mention is, is so these three, these three reasons, these three rationales, what it gives, you only need two out of three. So it doesn't have to satisfy all three. So we have enhancement and then you've only got to find another one, right? Which makes the, in my opinion, makes the, the whole policy difficult to sustain from a sort of ethical perspective. Um, but what people will do and and people will know and you know about this better than anybody is try to find ways to beat tests essentially right this is this is what happens when and i i know i can speak for a lot of athletes that they have major concerns over the testing and major concerns that it's not it's not sort of in place to promote their health or or even fairness right so they'll find no. ways 
because they've lost kind of faith in in the whole process. They'll find ways to circumvent, to get around these tests, right? And And you're uniquely qualified to talk about this because one of the things, you know, that you created, which as I understand it was a novel compound, is this this substance called the clear, right? THG. I'll let you give it, yeah, I'll let you explain. Yes. Well, there were actually three versions of, of the clear. The first one was a, a steroid, anabolic steroid that was developed by Wyeth Labs that it, it, it did reach uh, testing, human testing, and I don't think it was ever actually approved as a drug, but it was called nor- norbolithone. And it had a chemical structure that enables it to be unrecognizable at, for the testing methods of the time to be unrecognizable in their analytical uh, and their, their techniques of analyzing urine for anabolic steroids. The next one was a compound somewhat related to that called THG. That was an actual novel compound. Uh, that you, that you created, right? It was a synthesis. Yes, yes, I created that compound. And that was the one that most people are familiar with because when, by the time this Balco thing came to light, that was the one that everyone was using. And, and there, there were, a lot more athletes than anyone ever knows about that we're using these things. And I have some stories regarding that. Some of them I'm not sure if I want to tell because I don't want to get people in trouble. But uh, people will be pretty astonished that the scope of it went way beyond this Balco Labs and, and this, uh, the, the athletes that were a part of that. But either way, and the third one was another compound called desoxymethyl testosterone or Madol. And that was used post Balco for maybe a couple of years and then I completely got out of the whole thing. Right. Okay. I mean it's 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 interesting. People will remember, even in the UK, so so Balco is the Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative. People will remember it even in the UK. Obviously in the US I had a huge amount of media coverage. Um because it implicated, you know, a, a lot of famous athletes and there's a guy um called Victor Conte, who who was also uh, very much in, involved. And um, there's recently been a Netflix, Netflix documentary, for example. So there's a lot of media scrutiny and a lot of kind of media attention uh, on that. So it's quite interesting to kind of, I mean, I was wondering at the time, for example, did you sort of think about the ethical implications of, of any of this sort of thing? Somewhat. Uh, I thought to myself, Okay, I'm going to put it this way. When I first got into it, I was working with people that were not world-known, top-level elite athletes. I was working with people that, you know, competed on a high level, but maybe they were ranked sixth, seventh in their nation or in the world or, or whatever, and I provided them some of these compounds. And they quickly rose to be in the upper echelons of whatever sport they were in. And, and they, this was most of me sending stuff to various athletes that found me somehow around the world. Sometimes trainers as well from around the world that would then give it to their athletes and this gave, we get the same uh, very impressive response from it. I didn't feel bad about that because when these people garnered these benefits, they came back to me in the most appreciative manner and were very nice and I didn't feel as though I was it didn't feel bad to me. I felt as though I may have been helping out someone, helping them to reach that elite level that didn't have connections or the knowledge to dope as it was at the time, which was not easy to do because you'd have to get off on, take certain drugs, get off at a certain time. And these people did not have that sophistication or technology. And I enabled them to jump up into that upper level. And they were quite appreciative. Now, when I started working with this Victor Conti, he was giving it to world, you know, champions in whatever sport. And these people would, first of all, I never talked to these world champions. I, I talked to Victor, but I'm quite aware that these people didn't, they would take these drugs and they would kick everyone's ass, but they would always tell themselves, oh, it was me and my hard training. And they would they'd be unappreciative or un, not even want to acknowledge the elephant in the room or the gorilla in the room, that was it was in large part due to these undetectable drugs. Yeah, I mean, 
it's, it's super interesting because, as you said, Victor Conte, as I understand it, kind of tried to keep you as a sort of secret resource just for him, right? As this sort of, oh, I have this secret yeah. camera. Is, is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he he did. I, I At the time when we were working together, he wouldn't reveal my identity, which is fine with me. I didn't want to be revealed. But he referred to this guy called the clear man, the clear man out, you know, in the Midwest or something. And after he got caught and he tried to exploit the media attention, I completely disappeared from the picture. These were his drugs, so to speak. He wouldn't go talk about any contribution really of, of me or anyone else. And there's a lot of other people that helped him out too. He had, he had secret people working in the, in, 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 in USADA labs. He had, he had people that knew the top water people that would have lunch with them and then go back to Victor and tell him this is what they said. Um, and then of course he had me who, who he didn't even know about any of these drugs. They had these undetectable steroids were being sold before I even met Victor Conti. And I get to teach Victor to him. And so, but, that's just the kind of guy he is. And I, I don't let it really bother me. But a lot of people like that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to get the kind of... So it actually went further and deeper, perhaps, than people realize. Oh, it's so, the yeah, there's so many stuff. There's things here. Um, and I was supposed to be a part of that Netflix documentary, but I never fought. And they were very excited to have me because I was going to expose all kinds of things people never heard before. But it just didn't work out. I got I got uh, distracted by other things, so I don't know what kind of I didn't even watch it. I don't know what kind of documentary it was. I think it it must have been not, no new information. Just I don't. I, know. I don't think there was an enormous amount of new. I mean, obviously, I, I knew quite a lot about it just from my academic research, and just you know, I remember following it as a kid, essentially. But um, I, so another sort of hypothetical speculation question: what? If, if laws and these regulations and, and their laws, some of them in the US and, and some in the UK, um, you know, if they didn't exist, what what would you have done? Would you have done anything differently if, if there weren't these kind of regulations? Or how do you think about those sorts of things? Well, if there weren't the regulations, if, if there wasn't the doping reg- regulations, if, if athletes were subject to WADA or USADA, or whatever net countries doping associations testing, then there would have been no market for things I developed the undetectable steroids because you wouldn't need anything to be undetectable because there wouldn't be any doping testing. That's interesting. So I think so, that's my quite answer to that. Yeah, it's a good answer. It's not the answer I was uh, expecting either, but that's certainly you it's mean a more really like the legal ramifications. Uh, like the U.S. law, which is in, in my case was um, interesting. I was just uh, didn't think I was going to go down here this road, but uh, when I was arrested or indicted, I was indicted with counts that were not um, appropriate. Just a conspiracy to distribute controlled substance, for instance anabolic steroids or controlled substances. Now, the compounds that I developed, although in a pharmacological class, they were anabolic steroids. In a legal class, they were not. They were controlled C3 controlled substances. And in that class of controlled substances, the compound has to be the exact compound that is scheduled. These compounds are analogs. Now, in Schedule 1, Schedule 2, there's an analog act, and they could prosecute you for distribution of controlled substances if the substance was could be classified along with the the um, stipulations of that class but and not for antibiotic steroids and so I had to my attorney put together a very lengthy and good argument for me that I could not be prosecuted on this and the district attorney or prosecutor, came back and said, yeah, well, that makes sense, but, you know, he's going to plea anyway because we have the United States government, the power of the United States government will make him pay. And, you know, this was so high profile. My attorney said, you, you don't 
just to say yes, plead whatever you can get. And that's what happened. And I got a, I didn't get a very serious sentence. I mean, it's prison is prison, but it wasn't for very long. I mean, a lawyer, I, and I don't know whether this would be correct because I don't know enough necessarily about it, but so there was essentially a loophole is what you're saying, where it didn't apply to schedule three type. I, if, if I committed a crime, it would have been a, just an esoteric misdemeanor. FDA, not a felony, you know, not not at that distribution felony Distribution of, yeah. un, of an unapproved new drug or something because I, and they would have to prove that I intended it for drug-like purposes, which they could say, okay, well, you intended it to build muscle for athletes, but then, yeah, that just comes down such a, a lengthy road. What would be the ultimate sentence? I get probation. I, no, that's not going to work. I had, they had to, the only way for this to work was to find a felony and then to force me to plead it. So were they sort of arguing that you stayed within the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it? Was that the sort of going back to the spirit? Was was that the sort of argument they gave? Well, that's not that's not legally kosher argument. But well, they were. Well, the argument was this: the argument was we don't care if he really broke the law, but he's going to plead to breaking the law as we want because we have infinite resources and he has nothing. And that's to happen time to time in various ways. But you just, you can't, even if you're right, you can't, you need so much money to fight being right. And when, you, now it, would, it would never have worked out. I, it would have been the stupidest thing. I wouldn't have been able to afford to present a case. So, And that was because of the whole sort of media scrutiny on the Balco scandal and all that. That's yeah, why. They, they would have. They could have asked for any amount of money they needed to make sure that I paid, and, and they would have pretty much gotten it. So, I mean, this is this is really interesting stuff. There's the sort of story behind the story that you know you probably wouldn't get on the Netflix documentary because you weren't really you know you weren't directly in it. Um, so, just changing gears. Sorry, go on. Uh, no, no, I just no, I wasn't. I didn't own Balco. Uh, However, this the scandal, if you were to say the scandal involved the dissemination of undetectable drugs and athletes that were using them anywhere, I'd say between 1999 and 2005, or something like that. Yeah, I was right in the middle of it because I distributed this stuff to athletes in other countries. That is, it was much more pervasive than Balco. And I worked with a lot of people. And there were a lot, it's all, all kinds of. In all areas, but it just wasn't publicized. I never really felt as I want to run out and say uh, tattletale on, on everyone, everything. But I just wanted just that caveat there. No, thank you. Well, I mean, it's so obviously people will remember THG. They'll remember the clear, and you know, you created that. And I remember, I think Don Catlin, the, the head of the lab thought you were some kind of uh, genius, you know, because when they tested it and it just, again, in my layman's understanding, it just kind of, like it, it just kind of faded away. So they couldn't actually like highlight yeah, anything. Was, they used to use a technique called gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And in gas chromatography, it, it goes into a, a, this inlet port, which is a very high temperature, very low pressure. And a lot of labile compounds thermally labile compounds will, will disintegrate in the injection core and not make it to the column where which is where it's separated out and then to the detector. So you just had a bunch of small fragments of a molecule that ended up ever being detected by that method. That's why they switched to liquid chromatography gas spectrometry because it was at room temperature and you could see everything. Right. And it's so that's how it was the clear, right? That's how it didn't test positive. That's, well, it was, that's a secondary uh, benefit of, of its undetected or at facet of its undetectability. The, first and foremost, the compound itself would not show up. Even if, even if it did come get to the detector un, un, unmolested or so to speak. And on top of that, it wouldn't even make it to the detector because it's just destroyed upon injection into the instrument. Right. Okay. Even though it was these two, you know, it was two essentially other steroids, right? Well, this Combined. is now the thing is, if you really think about it, 
if this whole thing with Victor and they, they discovered the THG because he had a, a track coach named Trevor Graham, who Victor had a falling out with and got into a fight with. Of course, his fight cost me my freedom. I mean, he's just the way he was. I don't think he really gave, gave a damn about anyone else. But the guy ended up sending a sample into the lab and they looked at it without having you know, looked at it in, in, in a fashion where they did, it didn't fall apart. And they were like, oh my God. So if that had never happened, they would never have stumbled across it because they would kept kept using gas chromatography and it would have kept breaking down. And even if they were looking for telltale signs of a uh, design or steroid, which you might be able to see because of if if you didn't know the exact structure of it, they would never even known because you can't even tell that there is is a steroid like compound coming through the system. Right. So it was it was only the tip off essentially that that created the entire. Yeah. So I don't know what would happen. What I kept, I probably would have stopped. I was going to stop selling this shit any the stuff anyway, uh, because I was just. It was becoming way too ubiquitous, and I said, "This can't go on forever." Someone's going to, and of course, it didn't, because ultimately, someone's going to tell on someone else, and or something like that. Stupid. I mean, so. it's yeah, it, it, it's fascinating to get the kind of story behind the story. So, you you invented this this compound. I mean, is there anything legal or otherwise that that you wish you'd invented? So, obviously, you have this brilliant mind that this, this that could kind of do things that nobody else essentially could do or it certainly was doing you know is there anything any product that you wish that you'd invented um like anything uh, well, yeah. a, in the, regarding steroids i don't think i could have kept inventing other steroids that would be of any um it would be superior or offer advantages over any other steroid that's been developed in the past stopped out. I mean, that's the only thing I could do is make them in a fashion so that they're undetectable. And that's, and I think that they're so, they're so aware now that the uh, possibility of, of an undetectable steroids out there that they really look through the uh, results of your analysis with a fine tooth comb and look for any signs that there's something there. It looks like that corresponds to a molecular fragment or parent compound of a, steroid and then they look more into it until they figured out what it was and so yeah that's not even that's why i don't think there's any design or steroids out there i mean there were people who experimented a few things here and there and a few athletes but nothing widespread uh so that's that's over and i don't really want to get, go back to prison so <laughs> no that's yeah, perfectly that. understandable yeah i yeah. so i mean I associate you with with that because of my background, but you cre there, there are all sorts of other things that that I also kind of associate you with. For example, things like pro hormones, uh, DMAA, which is a, a stimulant, right? Yeah. So it, your expertise wasn't just confined to to anabolic steroids; it was you know, all sorts of other things as well, right? There are other compounds. Um, is it ascolic acid that that I associate you with as well? That is something that I try to develop uh, derivatives of. It's not something that I discovered. It was widely known as a component in, in plants and was studied by a University of Wisconsin researcher to, to show that, that, that it, uh, the effects on gene expression were, were uh, analogous or were suggested that it would have a pretty, pretty uh, substantial effect upon the dynamics of muscle growth, muscle atrophy. And that's why I looked into it because it's in its parent form, it's just not bioavailable. And I was trying to make it increase its solubility to therefore increase its bioavailability. And I, and I did some work on that, but that's it's just in the past. Okay. I mean, are, are there any kind of other products that, for example, you're working on now? Or I know that uh, our mutual connection, Dom D'Agostino, you've done some work with him uh, on ketones and, you know, the, which, which have applications for. All sorts of things. Anybody interested should should look at that video and uh, Dom D'Agostino's other work. But I mean, could you talk a little bit about the sort of development of ketones and and all the sorts of things you've done in that realm yes. as well? Yes, it's a brief to to do it briefly. 
uh, Dominic D'Agostino came to me around 2011, said he needed a, a compound synthesized, and it was something called a ketone ester. That was an exogenous ketone. Basically, you could take it orally, and your body would metabolize it into acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyric acid, which are the two endogenous ketones. I don't know if people don't know what ketones are. They're alternative energy substrates that are formed when your body fully metabolizes fat. They have a lot of, confer a lot of health benefits, uh, protection against cancer. They're, they're very effective substrates for energy in the brain and can help prevent seizures. They uh, increase the amount of mitochondrial function and, and, and then that indirectly leads to an anti-cancer effect. And there's a whole bunch of other things and possible performance benefits as well. So I developed that substance for Dom. He used it in some studies, got very good results, and his funding went way up. And then I said, Dom, I'm interested if you could help me test out some uh, alternatives to this that could be sold as nutritional supplements. And those were the BHB salts. So I developed the BHB salts. Well, BHB salts were available as a research chemical, but I developed a process to meet, make them inexpensively. And I wanted to get some intellectual property protection on them. So I, Dom, uh, along with myself, designed a study. Dom performed it to, that combined MC, uh, medium chain triglycerides with BHB to show that there was a, a, an effect that was, wasn't quite, uh, necessarily predicted, predictable. And we were able to get a patent on that combination. The, the BHB salts ended up becoming widely popular. Other companies, and MLM in particular, started to sell them. We started to manufacture for them first, and then they went to China. And, and we had a, a highly label company. But the thing is that the, the whole market for that, the whole that idea, it, it quickly got so out of hand that I wasn't able to to fully um, benefit, capitalize from it. And that's, that happens sometimes. You have to do some technology that becomes so popular that you've forgotten as the one that introduced it and you don't never get the reward that you think you might deserve, but that's just the way it is. So, Kind of a, a victim of your own success in that one. Um, yeah. yeah. And they have all sorts of um, kind of applications in military settings, for example, right? I spoke to Dom yes. about that. I mean, I'd, yes. I'd love to hear more about that. That's, that's certainly very interesting. Dominic initially came to me for this ketone ester because uh, University of Naval Research or something like that, or in DARPA, or these organizations that fund research for military purposes for soldiers, and they they wanted something to help Navy SEAL divers that use these things called rebreathers. So they don't get bubbles going up to the surface and they can re remain stealth. They needed some something to prevent the high oxygen levels from causing seizures because they get high oxygen levels of the, they're breathing the oxygen under very high pressure. So they knew that ketones are anti-seizure because children are or epilepsy take the shot the ketogenic diet and it's very effective and they know that ketones have a anti-epileptic effect anti-seizure effect so dominic's theory was that this ketone ester would uh increase the latency to seizures and this was demonstrated in rats that he gave with the garbage oral garbage to the rats this ketone ester and the rats have received the ketone ester lasted like three times a tremendously increased latency. They, they lasted like three times longer than the control rats in that pressurized oxygen chamber. So that was considered a proof of concept for the uh, use in Navy SEALs. Now, don't ask me if the Navy SEALs are taking a ketone ester. I wouldn't know. And I don't know what where that research led to. It could have led to some, some technique that they're using now or may not have. I, I don't know. Are you still involved in the in the ketosis research? No, no, I'm not. Uh, I was making keto. I worked on that ketone ester after I made the initial batches for Dom. I started to work on perfecting the synthesis of it, and I did was able to make it greatly simplify it and reduce the cost. 
And I was selling at Esther a little bit, mostly research institutions, but, but that kind of came and went and the company that I had that was doing that is gone now. So, Right. Okay. I mean, it's interesting because you have this, this amazing kind of track record of developing these compounds. So I guess this is more of a sort of general question, but if you were advising a, a, someone in your position, like a, they may not necessarily be in exactly your position, but like a young chemist or a young Patrick Arnold, I mean, what would you say? Because clearly you've got this amazing intellect to, to develop these things, but you perhaps haven't had the sort of rewards that that one might have expected. Um, I was just wondering, you know, what sort of advice would you give or, or what, what would your thoughts be on that? Well, and I do get asked this question fairly often, a lot of times by people that are initiating their educational experience in chemistry or something like that. And I, I don't necessarily know what to tell them. I say, if you want to do what I did specifically, you're going to have to get, you know, study organic chemistry at, at the graduate level. You're going to uh, synthesis most likely. You're also going to have to understand or identify novel applications for any chemical compounds of interest to you that you think you could synthesize. And then you, you need to kind of mold the two together, you know, find an application or find a compound or, or, or imagine a compound that could do such and such, and then set about, about synthesizing it. And that's what I would start to do. I, I mean, I came up with these pro hormone things, which are basically steroid compounds that convert to uh, testosterone in the body. And these were known compounds, but I developed a synthesis form and I identified, and I also knew the, the legal situation regarding dietary supplements and that such things could, at least at the time, be sold openly uh, without any legal. Yeah, I mean, pe people will have heard of things like 1AD, right? That was, you know, a very well-known one. Uh, that you were involved. Yeah, Andro was the first uh, stuff found in Mark McGuire baseball player's locker, Andro. And then there were second, third generations one, ones as well. But that that's now, no, they're, they're no longer allowed to be sold in the US, correct? Yeah, they're, yeah, they were banned over a while ago. So, I mean, if you think about these kind of, you, you must be very good at, at identifying not necessarily just the, the synthesizing the compounds, but these novel applications and thinking about how these substances, for example, could be could be applied, you know, their, their applicability and, and how they might be used. And I saw you uh, recently, uh, I think it's on your Patreon page, um, talk about this muscle sparing drug that, for example, could work with these GLP-1 agonists, right? That are getting a lot of media coverage at the moment. So in the UK, a a Zempic essentially. So Wigavi or uh, semaglutide uh, is, the, is the name, right? There's also another one called terzapatide, something like that. Yeah, yeah that's the uh, uh, Eli Lilly one. Yeah, and, and you've highlighted the fact that, so, so these GLP-1 agonists work really well, but you lose not just body fat, right? I'm wondering if you could kind of explain all about this and about this new uh, drug that's being developed as well. Yeah. Well, these GLP agonists are extremely effective in causing weight loss, primarily through appetite suppression. And they've been used quite for years now as, as in conjunction with its original usage or indication, which was for diabetes and for lowering A1C, which is a, an indicator of, of uh, chronic damage to the body due to elevated glucose levels. So, but the problem with the weight loss, which could be quite profound, people could use 20% of their body weight and it's you know, for a 200 pound person, 20% of their body weight is 40 pounds. If I'm correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a lot of weight, you know? Yeah. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> ten percent would be twenty, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. what am I doing? I'm like, it's just simple math. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're right. Even my math is good enough for that. <laughs> All right. So, but half of that weight loss was in lean body mass, 
primarily muscle muscle tissue, which is not healthy. And it also leads to diminishing effects of the weight loss because as your body loses lean body, body mass, your basal metabolism drops because muscle is a very highly metabolic tissue. And not only that, but it also lean body mass is very essential for survival. And if, and if you get sick, your lean body mass stores will uh, determine in large part where your survival, if you get really sick. Plus it's cosmetically undesirable to lose a lot of lean body mass. Yeah. And, and frailty and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, quality, being functional. quality of life. Yeah. I guess it was a, a company. I forgot the name of it. Uh, out in, uh, BioAge, oh, is it? BioAge, BioAge, yes. And they developed a compound called the Zeloprag, which mimicked a, and I don't remember the name of it because I wrote the blog a couple months ago. I don't remember the name of the endogenous hormone that's released by muscle, but it's termed, it's, it's in the class of uh, compounds termed exokines, which are uh, cytokines, or just uh, signaling molecules that released by a muscle during exercise. And this muscle has effect, this hormone, uh, exocrine, has effects on many tissues in the body, bone, adipose tissue in the brain, et cetera, cardiovascular. But it also has direct uh, or autocrine effects on the muscle itself. The muscle being exercised gets a boost in its regenerative uh, potential, potential to grow larger and stronger through the secretion an action of this exokine. It basically increases what's known as the satellite cell cell pool, which your body then your muscles use to incorporate something called new mild nuclei, which are essential to increase the production of proteins in the muscle, which is essential for growth. Now this azeloprag was is a non peptide, just as a peptide exokine. This is a non peptide analog, it's orally active. And it they found that it's quite effective in preventing muscle breakdown. So they combined this azeloprag with monjaro or uh, terzapatide, if I'm pronouncing that right. Semaglutide, right? It's that. Uh... Well, it is a terzapatide is a uh, another GLP agonist. Um, Novo Nordisk makes semaglutide, and I think Eli Lilly makes monjaro or ter- terzapatide. So. What they found is that they didn't, the people that used the combination of Bunjaro and Zeloprag did not lose the lean muscle mass. In fact, their overall weight loss was was increased. And that's probably due to the fact that when you don't lose lean muscle mass, you don't uh, experience the metabolic decline that you would have had you lost the muscle. So... You, you keep the muscle, you lose more fat. And so they're trying to get FDA approval for this combination. I don't know when or if it will happen, but I found, I thought it was pretty cool stuff. And I think it people should also, in, uh, outside of the whole concept of this drug combination, they need to be aware that when you take these GLP agonists for weight loss, most of that, or half that weight is coming in lean body mass. And so you have to be aware of that. Yep. That that uh, thank you for the explanation. So, I suppose I'm thinking again if, if it's a muscle sparing type drug, that's going to have off label uses, right? Yes, yes, but I don't. And that that Azeloprag has been studied, some clinical studies by that BioH place for uses in sarcopenia, which is age related muscle decline. And and also, I think a uh, muscle wasting due to chronic kidney disease. But I don't know if it will ever receive approval for these things, and it may only be made and marketed as a, if at all, as a conjunction to the Manjaro and that drug combination, because that's actually is has been filed as a new investigation of new drug, and it is going undergone clinical studies. So I don't know if people would ever be able to get their hands on a Zeloprag as a standalone to see if it enhances performance, so to speak. They would only probably be able to access it in conjunction with Manjaro. 
which would not be performance enhancing so much unless you're a bodybuilder or something. I mean, or a, a cyclist or something potentially. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, when you suppress your appetite like that, you're not, it's very hard to ingest all the the nutrients needed to to support a robust training regimen. So, I don't know. Or you could use it maybe in an off season and then get bounced back. I, I don't know. I just, I have a I mean, I, I was thinking about, um, for example, like Tour de France type cyclists who but they have know. no body fat to lose that's the thing yeah i guess that, that's what, you, what use killing your appetite would be if you have no body fat it's only going to lead to detriment detriments that's that's true i can i can see that and it's uh so continuing with this theme of sort of emerging tech I saw you also recently talk about these NAD boosters. So people will think of NMN and NR, nicotinamide mononucleotide and, and nicotinamide riboside, right? Which, uh -huh. well, I was wondering if you could kind of explain a bit, but um, I thought your thoughts on those were, were very interesting, um, particularly as well, they result. Yeah, go on. My thoughts on them are only a, uh, they're only they only reflect what's already out there that anyone could find out for themselves in the in the study and published literature they researched on. And now I got my interest in NAD and NAD precursors primarily for a personal standpoint because I want to be healthy and I want to live longer. And so I do take uh NMN, I take a gram every morning. It is uh there's NAD is has such diverse and numerous functions in the body. Anything that's an energy dependent process in the body almost always needs the coenzyme NAD to fuel the processes. And as an anti aging supplement, it's it's uh, effects on enhancing mitochondrial function because all those reactions in the mitochondria to generate ATP all require NAD to fuel them, to oxidize from one step to another throughout the citric acid cycle. Now, also, it fuels um, epigenetic processes, specifically these uh, proteins or substances called sirtuins that are essential to repair damaged DNA. And as we grow older, our DNA is all, it's very sensitive stuff, chemically speaking. And it's constantly being damaged by environmental toxins or just biochemical uh, wastes. So if these sirtuins and the, and the gene, DNA repair system is not working well, you're going to end up getting more and more deleterious uh, mutations and that could spark cancer. It could spark uh, cellular death, ep epiptosis. And so that is a, a big target and benefit of, of uh, NAD. And I'm just scratching the surface because there's so many other things. That, if, in fact, I wrote a blog on how the NAD demand in, in postpartum women is so high because they have to Manufacturing breast milk is a very energy dependent process. And so in the postpartum period, there's a great elevation of NAD metabolites and precursors in the blood that are released from the liver in an attempt to get those NADs or to enhance production of NAD in the mammary tissue to support milk production. So that is another of one of our probably just countless benefits or or energy dependent processes that would be dependent upon NAD and where NAD levels are essential. And they decline with age is, is the point as well, they right? They do yeah. decline with age. There's a, there's a sharp increase in these NADase or NAD destructive enzymes, one in particular called CD38. CD38, yeah. Yeah. So that goes up and your NAD levels drop. So there's actually two approaches to raising NAD and that is to supplementation with precursors and inhibiting the CD38 enzyme, which some compounds are known to do. And do you, do you do that as well? Is that? I, there's a couple of flavonoids or fla uh, isoflavones, flavones that, uh, that do that. 
and I've experimented with them. However, their bioavailability is so poor that I am not so sure that I am absorbing all these. I've experimented with different ways of formulating them to increase the solubility and therefore increase the bioavailability. Where I have no way to really know if that's working. So I, you know, I'm experimenting with ways to, to make a market effect upon increasing their solubility. And at that point, I may start to experiment with them more myself. Is that things like apigenin and, and those sorts of things? Apigenin, that... quercetin, uh, quercet, I think, as well. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. And are there any other sort of emerging techs? So, so as you said, this longevity, this anti-aging, I mean, what else, for example, do you do you do for, in that regard in terms of sort of supplements and, and that sort of thing? Is there anything else that shows promise? Yeah, there was one more that I, I've been doing experiments with, and I've also been doing experiments with increasing its bioavailability. And that is a polyphenol from cocoa. It's also found in green tea. It's called epicatechin. And it has a lot of benefits in enhancing mitochondrial biogenesis, mitochondrial function. It has great benefits upon cardiovascular or your your um, vascular health, increasing blood flow, uh, flow mediated dilation it's called. So obviously you need good blood flow to get nutrients to your tissues and all that. But the most exciting aspect of it is that it, it decreases the amount of a substance called myostatin, which is reduced in the muscle. And it is a ne negular, ne negative regulator of skeletal muscle growth. So higher, more myostatin you have, the less your potential of increasing muscle mass. And if you take myostatin away, you're the process of, of muscle growth will be enhanced. And it's known to do that. It's been substantiated to do that even more than once in humans. Yeah, uh, th there's a very striking image if you type in myostatin bull and, and that kind yeah, of thing. That, blue. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the, the, it's, it's interesting. So it, it inhibits that to a meaningful degree. I mean, could that yeah, be? Yeah, I mean, it, it actually... Uh, two to three fold, I believe it was, uh, in reduction in, in humans. And also, they demonstrated in, increased muscle mass, and increased muscle growth in humans that associated, that's considered to be correlated with the decrease in mass time. Interesting. In the world of sort of now we're on it, in the world of emerging tech, is, is there anything else that, that excites you or, or you think are you know, going to be sort of worth looking into or, or, or worth you know, we're going to hear a lot about in the next uh, few years? I can't think of any anything really offhand. I know there's, I mean, there's certain therapies that are being used for injury repair, regeneration, stem cells, there's certain peptide hormones that may or may not have potential, such as this BPC-157. Uh it's probably a lot of things that I've come across. It's just these things aren't at the forefront of my brain right now, though. What and another thing I've always wanted to ask you about, um, especially with your background, is people have thought a lot in sport about this idea of gene editing, right? And gene doping, or whatever we we'll, we're calling it. I mean, do you, I, I appreciate that this is speculation, but? Do you think that that sort of thing is already happening in sport? Because obviously you were at the cutting edge of, of developing things uh, that, that were used in sport. I think you have a very unique perspective. Well, I, I, I think it certainly could be used in sport. And I, I think it would be almost impossible to detect. I know, I know at one time I was sort of researching gene doping regarding a, a molecule called IGF-1 Insulin-like like growth with, factor, right? Yeah, and this yeah. would be muscle-derived or muscle-specific IGF-1. And the technology involved using a vector, these plasmids, or sometimes a, a something called an adenovirus, which is specific for muscle, and putting that gene within, let's say, the adenovirus, and the virus then attacks the muscle, inserts the IGF-1-producing gene in your the DNA of your muscle, and your muscle starts pumping out IGF-1, and your muscles get bigger. 
that would definitely, and that was shown to increase muscle size in the rats at least. Now, conceivably, there are other things are blood doping genes, uh, genes of other hormones, maybe related to fiber type, muscle fiber type, or or muscle anabolism. And if this was being used, it would have to be used by some uh, country or a group that was highly sophisticated. I I would think that by first and foremost, I would think China might be able to do this. Plus, China doesn't seem to have the ethical. <laughs> I'm not saying that the United States is, wouldn't. I would, on a, on a state-sponsored level, the United States would ever do something like that. But China, on a state-sponsored level, could. Russia could. I don't. I don't think Russia's got other concerns right now. <laughs> Plus, they got they got stagged for a pretty bad and embarrassing doping scandal not too long ago. Anyway, they did. But but as you said, it's interesting the, the speculation. China. We know that people have edited. Um, there was that famous case of of editing uh, for resistance to the HIV vi- um, virus, yeah. right? To um, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, there, there was someone edited two babies. Um, I, again, this is my layman's understanding, but it attracted a lot of scrutiny um, because he engineered um, resilience essentially to that. So we know that they can, and and people oh, are yeah. doing they do it. a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of genes that are known to do things that could have a wide variety of of implications in the in our individual. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that sort of the next big. Uh, frontier i think but as you said it would be largely undetectable so it might be happening and and we wouldn't necessarily be able to detect it with traditional but, methods right well i don't know how you would detect it however there could be ways to detect it that just don't seem obvious like for instance these if you were to like the technology i told you about with the igf1 gene doping that would require a method of delivering the gene to the muscle and maybe it's through detecting remnants of uh, these plasmids, which which carry the uh, DNA in a, in, a, in a chemical coating, whatever, and then possibly transfer it to the muscle. I believe that's how they work. Or the adenoviruses, which them themselves may or may not be able to be detected. At least they could detect them and then see if they do contain the IGF-1 gene. That would be a big red flag. But I don't know if this is doable. And I know that the technology itself is quite potentially doable, if not being done right now. Well, that that that's the thing, right? People may have said, you know, what you did was impossible at the time, right? It, or it could be all sorts of things going on that we don't necessarily know about. Um, oh yeah, and it could be it could be gone. It could and if it is going, I could continue to go on for a long time because I don't see if no one knows sees it. They we wouldn't suspect it. Oh well, okay. Let me take that back. If you start seeing Chinese athletes with physiques that are incongruent with the typical Chinese physique, you're going to be like, okay, this is not natural selection because you know your gene pool just would not allow for this. Or if you see records being broke at a rate that's indescribable, then you think, you know, some kind of dope is going. But as far as the technology being obvious or how, what's doing this, that would take some probably take somebody to just or the stroke of luck stumbling upon it, or someone that's involved in the doping being a whistleblower. Yeah, that that's uh, as you said that that's how it happened um, with 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 the Balco scandal essentially. That so what are you what are you working on? at the moment or, or what are you sort of most excited about working on at the moment? Well, right now I'm not really actively doing a whole lot. I'm trying to get, get back into doing some stuff. I'm looking what would to, kind of lure you back in then? What, what would kind of, well, yeah. I, honest with you, the, the, uh, everything in a regulatory basis regarding the nutritional supplement industry has become so, restrictive that it just not allow for me to be innovative. For instance, I cannot introduce a novel compound, no matter if it's ubiquitous in nature, harmless, or there's no indication that it would be harmful. I could not get any contract manufacturer to of any any um reputa- reputation to make such a thing because they are bound to FDA 
laws regarding good manufacturing practices and which also involve validating that the material is considered a nutritional supplement and any new compound would have to go through something called an NDI, new dietary ingredient approval process, which you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for safety studies, efficacy studies, and you could still be turned down and that's not feasible. So the only thing I could do in the realm of developing new compounds to be sold as nutritional supplements would be to take existing compounds that are already considered nutritional supplement products and then adding things to them to enhance their bioavailability or or adding other synergistic compounds to enhance the overall desired effect. And is there anything you kind of have your eye on there? Or yeah, I do. Other- I'm, I'm developing something with the various ingredients in it to, uh, uh, for an anti-aging type and, and a health promoting type uh, usage. And I've already kind of have a prototype formula. I'm, I'm working with my old partner to see if I can move that along and, and, and get it on the market. Interesting. I mean, there must be a lot of sort of labs that, that contact you, right? That, that want to work with you. I You're wish. shaking your head. I don't know, man. I, I don't think, I mean, you, you know, heard about me when you've been talking to me lately. So, but you th- probably heard about me before, but you were kind of in a loop. You have, we have certain uh, common contacts and associates. And so you probably know of me. And, but outside of that little small circle, which is a lot smaller, and I think oh, it could be blocked in some respects, regardless, I'm not very well known or, I will, maybe I was more, but it just doesn't seem that way. I don't have people contacting me like that. And, and I would, I would greatly welcome it. So anyone out there that wants to contact me, you know, I'm, I got time on my hands to work on stuff. What about you, even with the latest Netflix documentary, you don't sort of get. I was not in it. Uh, like I told you, they wanted me to be, and I was going to be pretty much the star of the damn thing. And, but I lost contact. I was, I was in the biz, biz, uh, busy, my company was shutting down and I was moving and all this stuff. So I had a, I didn't even watch it because I didn't, I just couldn't stand to watch that shit again. So, but I did have a brief mention I was told in it, but that's it. You, you certainly you came up. Who it was, it probably could have just passed it right by. You certainly came up a few times uh, in the documentary. I mean, looking back now, I mean, all, all this sort of Balco stuff was what, 20 years ago? I mean, how do you kind yeah, of- the, the, it, the initial raid and, on Victor Conti was 2003. Yeah, so so it is is it 20 is years. 20 years ago. I mean, yeah. looking back on it and, and looking back on your sort of role, I mean, how do you how do you kind of reflect on it? What are your thoughts on on that? I'll be honest with you. The process of me being uh, a convicted felon, an ex con, and subsequent. Uh, inappropriate attention by law enforcement that led to the shutdown of the Bell Large business I had in 2009. It led to uh, the default against certain loans that just pretty much it caused great damage in my life. And so I, at the, at the other hand, I got a lot of notoriety for that, that I don't feel as though I've ever sufficiently exploited and I'm I'm not sure how long that window of opportunity to exploit it is going to continue. But I, honestly, I, though, if you were to weigh the pros and the cons, I wish it never happened. I wish I I wish I just I'd gone right into the chemical industry. Let me work for a pharmaceutical company. I'd be much better off right now. I'd, I'd be looking at my retirement, and I'm now not even close to that right now. So, but I chose that path. Just didn't go as well as I would have liked it to. I mean, it's it's interesting how so you say outside that kind of community of of the sort of anti doping or dope, you know that that kind of the opportunities haven't presented themselves as you. As well, people have one. heard of me, so oh yeah, I've heard of you, maybe vaguely, or, but no, it hasn't. It it hasn't resulted in any uh, uh, opportunities really. I and I, I think if there were opportunities for me. They would have been in the past because of the regulatory situation that I told you about. There's no room for a chemist to to um, identify 
develop, synthesize um, for manufacturing or develop a synthesis for manufacturing of these new compounds. And that's where I, that's my, was where I shown, signed. And I can't, there's, the need for that is no longer there. So I'm just another person that I, I can do good formulation work. I can figure out how to make things more soluble or more bioavailable. And I, I can identify compounds with function functionalities and other ones that might fit well with that compound for a finished product. But that's something anyone could do. You don't need a background necessarily in chemistry like I do for that. Right. And I, mean, I don't and want to said, sell myself sure because I'm really good at it. What I can do, still, I am very good at it, people. So, just, I mean, clearly, but it, it seems like you're still dealing with the fallout of, of something from you know 20, 20 odd years ago in in some ways. Yeah, well, they, they definitely dealt with the fallout from it in two thousand nine, and that kind of set the stage for uh, closing a lot of doors to me, unfortunately. And I. I don't want to place the blame on, on anyone else. And, and I can only speculate what could have been, but I, I do feel sort of a bad blood with um, Victor Conte because he really played fast and loose with this whole thing. He ran around and told everyone that was going on, you go to these trade shows, everyone gave, I'd hear him talking to people about what he's doing. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? It's, and of course he, he had that little, that fight with, uh, and, and he would, he would do things like, we'd have email communications and he would email me about, Hey, could you send some of that stuff? The, the clear here. And I'd like, Victor, don't you think it's not a good idea to be emailing these things? And he said, well, just delete it. Or he'd say, have a deletion party. And I'm like, Victor, it doesn't work that way. I don't think you understand computer forensics. He said, well, I don't really care. <laughs> I'm like, well, you don't care because it's you. You probably want to get called, but I don't want to get caught, dude. I, you know, I, I have a potential career as a chemist. So I just went down. He was very irresponsible with his interactions with this Trevor Graham and his team, and that led to that strange being sent in. And I paid a big price for this. He he could afford to spend that little time in prison and be whatever the hell he claims to be right now, but I, I couldn't. So that's it. Yeah, I mean it's 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 surprising that he seems to have kind of come out. And I know, you know, he, he came out perhaps more unscathed. I mean, if he's making these de documentaries and those sorts of things, it's, um, he still, you know, he still talks about, is it Snack, his his company and all yeah, that sort of- Yeah, he still has the same company. And I think he's still trying, or he still has a lot of professional athletes. I don't know if he still does, that he works with. I think they probably- or still think he has some magic tricks up his sleeve, but I don't think he does. It seems, uh, yeah, like he was quite heavily reliant on on others to make him. He was a good salesman, perhaps, um, but not necessarily a, as brilliant a mind as as he might like to think. Yeah, he was also good at he was good at organizing uh, the protocols he had for athletes. He was good at getting them tested for. The blood test of various things uh, and just a, ZMA, a right? overall coordinator. ZMA. But no, I think he had no particular expertise that would was essential for carrying out such a th uh, thing. Yeah. I mean, he still, he he created ZMA, right? Or ZMA and, and those sorts yeah, of Yeah, yeah. It's zinc magnesium supplement, yeah. Yeah, which is, um, again, not not a bad supplement and, and a need, but it No, it's bioavailable form of zinc and magnesium. So is... Uh, magnesium glycinate which you can get at your pharmacy but eh, i don't know it's all in the marketing that's it i yeah, guess it's the marketing that's... exactly so just turning to kind of a slightly more um i suppose academic and esoteric um thing that you know subject that's very interesting uh for me personally with, with my background is if you kind of could design for example professional sports and wada or whoever you know, hires you as as the sort of policy guy. What would you? And obviously, we're talking in hypothetical terms, and and you know, in academia, we, we talk in hypothetical terms quite a lot. I mean, quite hypothetical. What, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, hypothetically, what what do you think that testing should look like, or or should we not even have testing? I mean, how would you kind of regulate? 
how would Harvard. you how would you solve the doping problem basically pretty much yeah pretty yeah. much that's my academic way but right. you summarized it well so yeah it's it's never going to happen now because i think that the whole sports doping industry usada wada the labs everyone that's gotten ph or grants for research on how to detect things in doping it's so huge right now that there's such a vested interest that they'll never give up that control never even discuss anything but zero tolerance so that's i think something we're always going to live for but let's say when we were in a perfect world and it's so hard to really think objectively and without the all the prejudice that's been handed down to us for the last century or so let's say uh we can get back to this whole thing regarding harm reduction. All right. Now, when it comes right down to it, we don't want athletes to get hurt. And we want there to be somewhat of a loving level playing for you. So if athletes were being were able to access doping protocols, doping methods, that under the supervision of experts, doctors, whatever, they could exploit and the testing people kept an eye on their health to make sure that they didn't go outside the bounds of, of uh, hurt, harming themselves, not harming themselves, then I think that that could be a place to start. Now, that there are other considerations here that that's not necessarily going to reduce or eliminate and that is do we really want children or adolescents looking at role models and knowing that they took drugs to get there now these are children these are adolescents first and foremost they don't have the, the psychological capacity to make informed decisions and to balance everything second of all many of the performance enhancing drugs are wholly inappropriate for children or adolescents. For instance, male hormones, steroids, anabolic steroids, testosterone-related hormone drugs. You give up to children or adolescents, you're going to stunt their growth. You're going to cause all kinds of problems. You're going to cause societal uproar or whatever. And I, I, there are already, obviously, there are young people taking these things and you can, you can see it. And it's it's kind of disturbing at times. So I, it doesn't eliminate that, but that in and of itself enough to ban their use for everyone of all ages? I don't have the answer. So that's a question that has to be addressed, in my opinion. Probably the, for the biggest question, if you really look at it objectively and practically. I mean, peop yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I've spent a lot of time considering it. I mean, people will say, for example, that the therapeutic use exemption process is abused by athletes. So that opens the door to this idea of, because it's not necessarily zero tolerance. It's it, while they might claim that it's zero tolerance, this, this idea of allowing certain things under a therapeutic use exemption kind of opens the door to what people, you wouldn't have crazy super physiological doses, but yeah, it could open the door to, maybe what people might call physiological doping. And and you've explained that, for example, in the context of sprinters, they're not actually taking enormous Mr. Olympia bodybuilding dosages, right? So a small amount in those guys with incredible genetics, those those guys and girls, goes a long, a long way, right? Oh, absolutely does, especially for women, since women such low levels to begin with, doesn't it's very little to cause a, a noticeable response. So, but this therapeutic use exemption, I think it's being scaled back in a lot of places. I know that they had a, th a therapeutic use exemption for testosterone in the uh, UFC, the mixed martial arts organization, and they limit, they took it away. I'm uh, not sure why. Maybe they were figuring, okay, this, this kind of ruins the idea of zero tolerance that we try to perpetuate. So we really have to go back to zero tolerance. Well, zero tolerance in, in anything is just not a good, it's not a good practice. I mean, look at it, this 
Roe versus Wade being uh, eliminated in the United States. And some people are like, okay, we, not, we want zero tolerance for abortion. And you have children getting raped. You have women that are going to die if they carry their fetus to term. And then you have some people are demanding that no, zero tolerance. Any doctor that performs abortion on them is going to be personally prosecuted. It's, it's hard. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. It's a good way to look at life. Life is not, life is gray, you know? And, and zero tolerance in those sorts of contexts, zero tolerance and harm reduction. It's hard to kind of square those two together, if you see what I mean. It's hard to square the circle of yeah, zero tolerance yeah, well, and harm they're, reduction. They're, they're completely incompatible. So you can't even talk about harm reduction unless you're willing to abandon zero tolerance policy. It, it, that's exactly the point I'm making. Yeah, that it's hard to kind of, if it's a meaningful, sort of a really meaningful attempt at harm reduction then as you said that that kind of closes the door in in some ways on on harm reduction uh sorry on uh, zero, zero tolerance. tolerance yeah and it's and like i said the water you saw uh she was trying to think of that term uh Eisenhower used for the military industrial complex, the, the water you saw the complex or the, the anti-doping complex is just has too much power and so you're not, you know, I don't think you're ever going to see anything considered but zero tolerance. And, and, and if there's excuse exemption, that's a rarity. I, 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 that's what I believe. Even, I mean, so there are kind of athlete voices calling for perhaps some kind of limited, obviously, but limited kind of liberalization. And there are some sports that we've seen, you know, bodybuilding being the obvious example, some strongman, some powerlifting, for example. I think where- for a while there was there was very lax, if any, regulation in uh, CrossFit. I don't even know if CrossFit's that big a deal anymore. But yeah, I mean, you saw some of the people competing in CrossFit and they were like, no way. <laughs> no way this fly, if you saw it, it was testing them. I mean, well, yeah, I think yeah, you're probably right. It, it's it's interesting, though, that people often will think that it would just be chemical warfare and more is better, but it, it's just not as no, simple I mean, as that, right? It's, it's just the fact that you're an athlete and you, you need to have optimal health, I think would eliminate the potential for abuse. And if anyone were to abuse these things, it would, it would reach a level of hindering their performance. But even with that said, I still believe that there needs to be some oversight or it needs to be uh, oversight needs to be allowed. People need to be able to go to a doctor to advise them. And then maybe there could be a, a discipline could arise. And this, of course, is the alternative universe. A, a, dis, a medical discipline could arise that for cosmetic and performance enhancing specialists that know how to know about all the available drugs, know how to administer them and know how to reduce harm and to detect any adverse effects as the person is going along. We almost, we're getting very close to that with the sort of longevity, anti-aging, regenerative medicine physicians, I think. Which is generating a lot of backlash from the FDA, as we know. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. But I do think we are... Compound pharmacies a lot. They're using some of these things. Really tightening up on regulations. I do, yeah. I mean, but I do think we are kind of developing physicians with that uh, sort of. And I, and I also believe that, that society, we're, the uh, consumers, or, or the population is becoming more and more aware of these of this technology, and they want it. They want to use it themselves, and they they're asking questions like, "Okay, why is this bad? Why can't I use this? Why can't I enhance my quality of life for you know, say this the last." 34 years of my life. This is not doping. This is not hurting anyone. I am not competing with anyone at, well, I mean, if they were, who cares? <laughs> Sorry, old people, but I'm one of them too. So, but it's, it, you know, so it, is, it could open up the uh, uh, forum or room for debate on the subject in general, which is, which is a good development. Yeah, I agree. It's it's certainly something that I think has become. I mean, it's attracting more, more and more attention. This longevity, this anti aging kind of movement, um, where you know, for example, in the context of hormones, we we spoke about it earlier. But 
TRT, HRT is becoming more well known and more prevalent, I think. Um, so perhaps there's a trend in that direction. I mean, some people will talk about TRT and HRT. I'd love to get your views on this, but they'll talk about the psychological uh, implications. And I think this is something that's often neglected, that people are obviously you know, very aware of the physiological um, implications of taking things you know, like anabolic steroids, but the psychological, um, the psychological implications. So I've heard you talk about this a little bit, and there's something I've always wanted to ask you, but do you think, so obviously there's the, there's the notion that getting bigger and stronger will make you more kind of physically imposing and increase your confidence and that kind of thing. But beyond that, do you think that certain sort of anabolic steroids, for example, have a psychological effect on people as well? Yeah, well, one thing that's been known for many, many decades, 50 years more, is that testosterone or males in as a secondary effect of increased testosterone have a much greater three-dimensional three visual acuity, Okay. So if you go, and that could have been something, a, a revolutionary uh, revenant or, or, or whatever, um, because males were the hunters. And so to be able to hunt, you have to be able to see things in 3D space, judge distance, and throw a spear or whatever. And that could have benefits in sports such as our, you know, obviously it's the hunting sports and baseball, for instance, where you need to see a pitch coming at you, you need to gauge where it is in, in space, its velocity, and adjust accordingly. So that is one uh, psyche, uh, psychological or, or mental area that steroids can affect in, in quite effectively. It also can affect uh, your motor nerve function, reaction time, which once again, baseball, that would be a big deal. You know what I mean? You know, be able to swing that bat in a split second when you have to. It enhances confidence in such a way that you don't, you're able to handle the stress of competition much better. You don't, you don't get, um, you don't have uh, reservations about okay, will I perform? You're not you're not as nervous, and so that in that aspect, you will probably perform better. You'll have more composure. It can increase assertiveness, aggressiveness, in some people as well. However, that's a, that's an area that's a negative and a positive. And positive aggression or channeled aggression. Would, is also associated with that increased focus or ability to kind of re relax and see everything in a focused fashion. And that is not unchanneled aggression, which is another thing, which is like roid rage, getting out of your car and beating the hell out of someone to tailgating you. Now, some anabolic steroids more than others and at very high doses can result in a, in a, in a, in a very irritable de demeanor and quick trigger mentality. But that is something that is greatly over overstated and very conditional from and inter-individual variability is great for that. I mean, so two things I'd, lo I'd love to pick them up on there. I mean, I can imagine that certain steroids, for example, could be very useful for certain sports. So like, combat sports or powerlifting or something where you need to have this aggression. So something, again, this is my anecdotal kind of from talking to people, uh, you know, I don't have scientific studies to back any of this up, but people will talk about, you know, halotestin or halotestin and fighters or powerlifters and how it can help you kind that, of. That is a, that is something uh, that, I wouldn't call it an old wives' tale necessarily, and there's some truth to the fact that these, some of these things can make you irritable and aggressive. However, that could very quickly become a detriment. Like I said, unchanneled aggression is only going to waste your energy 
you're just going to be angry and you can you can fight very effectively angry but after 30 seconds to 60 seconds you're going to run out of juice and get your ass kicked it's the guy that's kind of calm kind of keep it's a level level of uh level energy that ultimately usually prevails in those situations now another thing that i think steroids could probably do is, is increase your pain threshold i and now i don't have uh science objective science necessarily or if i did see it one time i forgot but i know just generally from people's experiences that they're able to train harder and longer and not feel the pains that they would normally feel and they could go out and compete very strong very aggressively and not maybe they get punched in the face if they don't feel it as much or or they're just not they're just kind of in a zone where they're they don't experience it and in a way that most people would. On that, while, while we're kind of on this subject, because you mentioned sort of old wives' tales, that kind of thing, are there any, you know, kind of misconceptions or myths surrounding anabolic steroids, for example, that, that you'd like to kind of dispel or, or that people, mistakes that people make uh, in thinking about them that, that you could perhaps clear up? Well, there are effects upon uh, sexual function are they very widely they can enhance libido they can suppress libido this depends upon the individual depends upon the drug depends upon duration of of uh taking the drug there are some things that are real consequences and that's such as um gynecomastia which is enlargement of male breast usually due to an imbalance where estrogen levels are out of whack. There is also testicular atrophy, which is a no brainer because when you take a testosterone like drug, your body's going to shut down the testo testicles in their production of testosterone. And that in turn reduces the size of the testicles. And that usually can be recovered if people, their duration of taking the steroids is small enough and that they take enough period for them to recover. Long-term use of large amounts will result in irreversible atrophy, which some people find cosmetically uh, unappealing, as, but it, it would not be life-threatening or dangerous in that, re in that respect. It's one thing that, I, that I've also always wondered about. Um, so I, I worked in the fitness industry for years, and I've seen people you know, go on and off steroids, for example. And I think that sometimes coming off them it is very difficult for people. And, I, and I've seen, you know, big guys and, and, and sort of very much lose their, lose their kind of sense of self and very, become kind of more reliant, for example, on this image of themselves as a big muscular guy, for, for example, and then they end up coming off them and, and really struggle. I, I was wondering, you know, if you could kind of, Give me your thoughts on on those sorts of things as well. Yeah, well, obviously you have to be psycholog psychologically prepared, and you have to be realistic about what's going to happen. Now, a lot of these, a lot of bodybuilders that were very large at one time, uh, some of them discontinue not only their drug use but their exercise. A lot of times they can't continue to exercise like they used to because of injuries. And that's a lot of times they don't eat the, eat the same way. And a lot of times they, their physique can't change quite dramatically. They become smaller people. A lot of them do still stay in very good shape. And they look definitely look in better shape than your average person of their age. Uh, some people like very unfortunate things happening, like uh, Ronnie Coleman used to be Mr. Olympia. He trained really heavy. And he totally tore his, his, screwed his back up, his discs or something like that. And he's just, he can't walk. His legs out to feet and, and he's, uh, but he seems to keep a very good attitude and he's aggressively uh, approaching his, his treatment with a very positive attitude. And that's commendable. So if you're taking the amount of drugs and if you're training and eating the way someone that's a heavyweight bodybuilder or pro bodybuilder or something, you're going to get so huge that you inevitably you're going to have to lose that mass. So if you're 
self-esteem and your identity is tied too much to your physique and being powerful looking, then you're going to have a very tough time. And I think a lot of people these days realize that, okay, this physique I have right now is, is, is not me. <laughs> it would have never been me if it weren't for all these things I did. And I have to get ready to go back to the me that maybe would have been me if I never done any of this stuff and be okay with it. I think that's that's really interesting. Yeah, people talk about, oh, you know, you were renting that physique, you didn't buy it type type thing. And um, very interesting to hear about, you know, the sort of psychological impact that, that people don't necessarily talk about as much from someone who, who actually does kind of understand uh, about these things. <laughs> 